Hey everybody, and welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Uh, excited for this one. Uh, I've been thinking about this one for a while and getting it planned was something I was really, really happy to have. So today's guest, or tonight's guest, I suppose, is uh, Dr. Sarah Lockyer. We're going to be talking about the work she does with um, DHH, which some of you might not know what it is, but we'll get there. <laughs> There's some layers to this, so we'll explain all of that first, and then uh, we'll move into some different things. But as always, again, this is uh, kind of like a casual chat. So if you have questions or we're not, maybe we slip in acronyms or stuff you don't know, that may happen. <laughs> so please, uh, please ask questions at any time. Uh, and we'll get to it when we can. So thanks for joining me, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Brad. I really appreciate you asking me to be here. And I'm kind of really excited about this. So it'll be good. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, I first saw you talk. I don't even know what year it was now because time seems relative now with everything going on. Uh, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't really matter. A few years ago, anyway, you were talking about what you do. You did, you know, a general overview of what you do, but you were doing a specific case, and that was really, really interesting. So after uh, that, I'm just kind of hooked on what you do and following you on social media and trying to keep in mind that this is what you do is ongoing, right? That is, to me, is fascinating like that this doesn't end i mean i like because i've been to the battlefields of the first world war and the second and this is an ongoing thing that you do and you were just in france i believe before the holidays i think you said you were yeah so that was really really cool that you're still doing this so again kind of how i like to start these things is how did you get doing this kind of work uh, if you want to explain real quick what you do and kind of how you got here that would be great Sure. Um, so by training, I'm a forensic anthropologist. I also have some training in forensic archaeology, so I can do both. Um, the archaeology part is really sort of recovering human remains, finding human remains that have been uh, buried in clandestine graves and things like that. And then the forensic anthropology part is really um, look on uh, looking at the skeleton and uh, trying to determine who that individual is based on the skeleton. And um, so as to how I got into this um, really quick, when I was 16 years old, I was watching a Canadian production called uh, True Crime, I believe. It, no, Exhibit A. It was called the TV mm. show was called Exhibit A. And the television show, that one that came on the episode, uh, there was a, a woman forensic anthropologist who came on and explained how she did what she did. And, you know, growing up in, in small town New Brunswick, in Moncton, New Brunswick, nobody had heard of forensic anthropology. I didn't want to be <laughs> like everybody else. I was like, that's cool. I want to do that. <laughs> Um, and by some miracle, it, it ended up happening because it is admittedly quite popular at university. You know, call it kind of the CSI effect where it's it's quite, right. uh, it's quite popular and things like that. And then TV show Bones came out and then it's really popular. So there's a lot of people who study it, but there's not that many jobs in that field uh, right. on a full time basis outside of academia. And academia was never really something that interested me. So um, I started working in the public service as uh, an executive assistant to the Director General of Human Resources at uh, Justice Canada. Okay. <laughs> Not at all related to my training or anything like that, but it was a job. It was a foot in the door. It was, you know, a job to pay the rent. Right. And um, one day when I was in a different administrative, uh, admi administrative assistant position at Parks Canada, I was looking through the internal job postings on the mm. uh, jobs.gc.ca to see, okay, I wasn't qualified at that point to apply, but I figured, okay, if I can prepare myself for when I do become officially a public servant, then maybe I can start looking at different jobs now to prepare myself to see what's available. Mm. And I saw a casualty identification coordinator and I thought to myself, what is that? And, I <laughs> it, and it was like, oh my God, it's that one job at DND as a forensic anthropologist. But I wasn't eligible to apply at the time because of my status within the public service. Hmm. So I reached out anyway to HR and said, look, like I uh, I want to talk to the hiring manager because I'm really well qualified for this. I'm fluently bilingual. I'm in the area. I'm interested. I'm not I'm not uh, eligible to apply right now because of my status, but I still want the hiring manager to know. And then that just kind of started a process where I was put in touch with them. They got my CV. Mm. Um, and then eventually they got to a point where they were able to offer me the position on a, on a sort of term basis for a year. Mm. And 11 months within that year, uh, they offered me the permanent position. So well, that's great. That's always great when that happens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I live in Ottawa too, right? So I'm used to hearing all these stories about working your way through the government and all the the 
the hurdles, I suppose, is probably the best way to put it about all oh, getting to these jobs that people want and everything. So it's it's great to hear when one works out. <laughs> I call it uh, polite pestering because every three, four months I was like, hi, like I'm still here. Don't forget yeah. me. Um, oh, by the way, my status has changed. So if you go and are mm -hmm. able to post it, now I can apply for it, you know, and, and giving them these updates or, oh, by the way, I have a new job now, but I'm still interested if yours comes up, you know. So polite <laughs> pestering is what I call it. Every three, four months, I would reach out. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Uh, people love that story already. So you're going to, well, Susan, who's a regular watcher and supporter of the channel you're gonna if that's you love that story you're gonna love uh sarah's other stories she's a well, great storyteller <laughs> she's a great storyteller so a random question but this is kind of what we do here sure. um, lorelei another supporter who lives in the states says she you look familiar have you been on anything else like this or just stuff within the government i don't i don't know um not anything sort of directly related to history and i, I see that lorelei is referring to uh I'm assuming that's World War II TV. Yeah. Uh, no, I have not been on World War II TV before. Um, mm. I have been on um, Canadian media, however, Canadian news. Um, I've done things with TVO. I've okay. done uh, stuff on CBC The National. Um, I had a camera crew follow me for like a, a week in France from CBC <laughs> The National one year. Yeah. Um, so I've done things like that, but nothing really sort of focused on military history like this in this kind of format other than uh the the conferences at at laurier uh, university well we're, we're pretty relaxed over here so it's not going to be anything uh, <laughs> too button up that's for sure we just love a lot of, everyone watching loves history loves learning so this is uh this is why this is great. So uh, anyway, yeah, I didn't think you had been on, but maybe uh, Paul Wittach runs World War II TV. He's, he's great. He knows so much and so many people maybe he would be a good fit for there at some point. Uh, anyway, so what I, you did prepare a slideshow. You're, you're, we're not, may not stick to it all the way through, but I think I thought it would be good to kind of explore um, kind of the program and what you do, or, sure. you know, a little more detail, and then we can just kind of go from there. Sounds good. Just let me get that pulled up here. There, there's the officialness, which we'll skip over. <laughs> so yeah, so just if you could just kind of give us a rundown of what, well, you said you were confused what it is. So tell us what it is. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I, as casualty identification coordinator, my main responsibility is to manage the casualty identification program. And the casualty identification program uh, right now is within the Directorate of History and Heritage within the Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces. So the program uh, was started kind of officially in 2007, mostly because more and more sets of human remains were being discovered overseas. And the technology at that point related to DNA and things like that was getting to a point where it was allowing us to identify uh, those sets of human remains at um, sort of less cost, less time consuming and things like that. Okay. So the program was officially started in about 2007. And in Canada, uh, there's 27,000 Canadian war dead from the First World War, Second World War and the Korean conflict with no known grave. So yeah. essentially, we have no idea where they are. Now, mm -hmm. we do believe that the vast majority of them are properly buried underneath a Commonwealth War Graves Commission headstone. But if, uh, like you said, you've been through these cemeteries, you'll, you, I'm sure you've noticed that there's like almost three different categories of unknown soldiers. There's just yeah. unknown soldier with no nationality. There's one like the headstone that's on the screen here where you have their nationality. And then yeah. there's other headstones with more specific information, like their rank or date of death or their regiment or something like that. So even because of that, like, we still don't know how many Canadians are already properly buried in Commonwealth War Graves Commission headstones. So we right. kind of have to go by that 27,000 number. And that 27,000 is kind of divided about 20,000 for the First World War, about 7,000 mm -hmm. for the Second World War, and 16,16 in Korea. So mm -hmm. we have two different processes, um, two different types of investigative cases that we take on. Uh, we take on what's called identification of remains cases, which is what I'm predominantly going to be talking to you about today. And then we do what's called identification of graves cases. So this is a process uh, that's relatively new to us at DHH, and it's a purely historical and archival research-based investigation. The reason being is that once the remains are buried underneath a Commonwealth War Graves Commission headstone, they can't be exhumed for any reason whatsoever. So I can't even get in there to get a sample to do DNA. Well, it, 
except for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. That's you know, that's the only that one yes, that Canada. was the exception. That was that's the exception. The except um, the one. Yeah. Exactly, and and there there were a number. From my understanding, this happened admittedly when I was still in high school in two thousand and one, so I wasn't really paying attention to those kinds of things, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, I, from my understanding, there was a set of rules that was given to Canada by Commonwealth Warriors Commission of you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you know, if, if we allow you to do this. So usually that identification of graves cases, um, what tends to happen is it's a member of the general public who has gone to a cemetery and found a headstone and said, you know what, I think that, you know, private bloggins is the one who's buried in that grave. We tend to sort of um, make them go to Commonwealth War Race Commission because on their commemorations page, they have a really good breakdown of the kind of evidence that's needed to confirm that type of hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is that the uh, the member of the public submits their research to Commonwealth War Race Commission. Commonwealth War Race Commission will do their own research through their own records that we don't have access to nine times out of ten. Yeah. They'll then send everything to us with their recommendation to either sort of accept or um, refute the, the original hypothesis. And then we do the exact same research from scratch all over again, using our records to see if we can corroborate or reject the original hypothesis. So um, that's, like I said, it's purely historical and uh, yeah. archival research, but it does happen. Um, so that's great. Mm -hmm. Now, since about 2007, there's been about 35 sets of remains that have been identified by the program, and we've been able to change eight headstones to one with a name on it. Uh, and, and these identifications happen almost on a yearly basis. Now, COVID has kind of uh, complicated a few things, so we're not yeah. as sort of, um, in the last couple of years, haven't been as good because of a number of different circumstances that have been outside of our control, but uh, identifications happen almost on a yearly basis. So there's kind of three main points, main tenants to the casualty identification program. Um, and sort of if you just hit your space bar to get the next uh, little, there we go. So um, it's, it's essentially a reactive program. So the investigations kick in once a set of human remains has been discovered. Uh, so we don't actively search and recover human remains. Now there are exceptions. Uh, there was a case in 2016 uh, Private Duncanson in Belgium, we we had irrefutable evidence of where he was, so okay. we went to go get him. But a lot of the times, uh, we'll, we'll get uh, questions from the public of, well, you know, he's in this grid reference. I'm like, yeah, but those grid references can be kilometer square. So, like, I can't just go to France and dig up a kilometer square because I'm definitely going to find something, highly likely some unexploded ordnance. Yeah. Um and I may very well find, you know, British, German, or individuals from other nationalities, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of have to have, you know, irrefutable evidence of where they're located. And like I said, it, it's very rare that Canada will go and recover human remains. Uh, like I said, there's no exhumation of war graves. So once they're buried, that's it. And also the remains are not repatriated to Canada. Uh, they are buried in the closest appropriate cemetery to where they fell. Now, I do, however, bring um, a sample, a skeletal sample back to Canada for DNA analysis. But whatever's mm. left over after that analysis, that then goes back to be buried with the rest of the remains. So um, if you go to the next slide, it, it all kind of comes down to, you know, equality and death, which was a sort of a central tenet uh, when the Imperial War Grace Commission got together and, and got was formed. Uh, the yeah. Dominion of Canada was one of the member nations. Um, and that's kind of something that we really, really sort of uh, hold up, equality and death. So during the burials, they all get the same treatment, no matter their rank. Um, and that's one of the main reasons also, like, you know, for Canada, we have the maple leaf. Everybody gets the maple leaf on their headstones, right? They, everybody yeah. gets the same treatment. And I think that's kind of really important. Um, and that also means that, you know, there's there's no repatriation to Canada at all. Mm -hmm. um, now, that law changed in Canada in 1970, where anybody who died uh, in service of Canada in a theater of war was then repatriated back to Canada if they died after 1970. But anybody who died before gets buried in the closest appropriate cemetery. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing happens for uh, Korea. 
So there's no Commonwealth War Graves Commission for the Korean War, the Korean conflict, but it's still something that we respect, this equal, uh, equality in death, so that those um, those who hopefully at some point, I'm hoping, uh, who are found in, in Korea and identified will get buried in Korea. Right. Uh, yeah. Just let, let us jump back for a second here to, I guess, from the last slide, but about what is, uh, you said, irrefutable evidence about identity or location. What does that mean exactly? It right. So I'll use I'll use Private Duncanson's uh, situation, um, or there was a situation yeah. where somebody stumbled upon a uh, aircraft wreckage in British Columbia and remains right. were there, and you you saw the remains, right? So we knew they were there. They were relatively accessible to the public. Um, so this it was more of a sense of we got to do something because somebody else might do something that might not be uh, sort right. of. Ideal, uh, because grave robbing happens. People want, yeah. you know, artifacts or whatever. But with mm -hmm. Duncanson as well, um, partial remains had been discovered by accident. Mm -hmm. And following, the, we did some historical research, and it was a very small field. We had very detailed war diaries, very detailed personnel files, uh, information. So we kind of took the chance that, you know what, like, and also the soil, the type of soil that was there would highly likely very well preserve the remains. Um, mm -hmm. We really believe that if we went back, we could find all of him as opposed to just the partial remains that were initially discovered. And um, but it took a year and a half of negotiating with the Belgian government, the Belgian uh, Ministry of Defense or Na Department of National Defense equivalent. Uh, we had to get the proper permits because you can't do archaeology without permits. Like people think you right. can just go to a country and dig. No, you need all kinds of permits from every level of government. We had to get the landowner's permission because he was a small farmer. He owned a small farm right. and he gave us four days. And he was like, if you guys don't find anything in four days, you're out of here because I have to uh, plant my crop or else I lose my livelihood. Right. So that comes into effect right. as well. Um, yep. And we were lucky on day two that we found him on day two. And we were able to uh, collect about more than 95 percent of the remains. Like there's there's a lot of small bones mm -hmm. in the hands. So the, sometimes yeah. there's a couple that tend to be missing. But um, yeah, with him, we were able to sort of get everything because we had a very, very, very good idea of where he was. We also had to work with uh, jurisdictionally appointed archaeologists, because in Belgium, archaeology is heavily regulated, mm. like in other countries as well. And for them, there's different archaeological firms that work in different areas. So they were the ones who are doing the work. They just allowed us to be there. If they had not allowed okay. us to be there, well, it's up our hands, right? Because it's in a right, different right, country. Right. So those are the kinds of things you have to think about. Um, and, and those types of opportunities don't come often at all. No, not from what I've heard anyway, but I've heard similar, not necessarily in a Canadian context, but it, it has happened. Yeah. Uh, question is there, do you have any more details about, about Duncanson, like his regiment, anything about him that we, we know? Uh, yeah, I'm he, if I remember correctly, uh, so he was actually the first burial I went to. He was buried on September 14th, um, 2016. He died on September 14th, 1944. We were actually able to bury him like within an hour of his death to the day oh, wow. 72 years later. Yeah. He was with the Algonquin regiment. Okay. Uh, but, oh, yeah. um, if you go to, if people want more information about private Duncanson, they can Google casualty identification. Our website is the first thing that comes up and there's an index of all of the okay. service members that we've identified. And there's a biography for private Duncanson that you can click on, learn more about oh. him, learn about the battle that the last battle he was in. And with them, uh, towards, I think, the middle of his biography or somewhere around there, there's actually a video, about a three-minute video uh, uh, from the, the Bearer Party commander talking about his experience burying one of his own, burying Private Duncanson. Uh, there's, there's video of, of the burial ceremony on that page. So, uh, yeah, so Google casualty identification. Go to that web page. There's an index of identified uh, war dead, and you can go through there and look for Duncanson's name and then get his biography. Yeah, and anyone for anyone watching uh, later, I'll uh, I'll link it down below the website um, to uh, 
to the program because that's how I found details for this. Um, <laughs> and then uh, your your Twitter is also shor- shared on there because you're giving lots. You, that's why I learned you were in France looking just before the holidays there about. Yeah. But maybe we can ask about that later. But, but that's it's great to follow you and learn what you do through social media. Um, yeah, I think it's Leopold Canal would be my best guess if it's if it's Algonquin yes. Belgium in forty four. That that's my yeah, guess. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly yeah. it. <laughs> That's where my head went to the first thing as you said, uh, Algonquin. Uh, yeah, actually, we got an answer from the Great Dominion Watches as well, but I just want to double check, and maybe I'm not understanding Scott's question fully, um, about air crash sites out of Canada. I think when he means exhume, I don't think that means necessarily re- maybe reburial. I'm not, I'm not sure what exactly Scott means, but maybe you could talk about what, what has happened with that in the past, if it has come up for you at all. Yeah, um, it, it does uh, from time to time. The answer is predominantly no um there's a lot of factors that come into play when it comes to air crashes and uh wreckages from aircrafts the big thing that we have to remember is who owns the aircraft right and okay. if, it's yeah. an R- right. if it's an raf aircraft but we have rcaf on that aircraft it's still an raf aircraft so it yep. is the brits who get to decide what happens they take the lead on it um, they are the ones who also still own that aircraft. Um, so there are situations where, uh, and it happens quite a bit in, in some European countries where there's a lot of people who try to find these aircraft, uh, these right. wreckages and recover the remains. Um, now some, they're great. It's great that people are looking for that, but sometimes it ends up complicating the process that much more, especially if they're recovering human remains and they have nobody on staff who, knows how to properly do that. It can right. cause some complications. And um, because also what we have, what's important to remember is that the sheer amount of force that is applied to the human body in an aircraft wreckage, in a crash, is huge. So you will have remains that have been sort of spread out over quite a large area. And um so yeah, so but the biggest thing that that's important to remember is, is who owned the aircraft. So we have yeah. a lot of situations where it's actually the British and they're going to get to decide, are we going to go recover that aircraft or no? Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes we have to think, is the site accessible? Uh, because we are aware of some crashes outside of Canada, but some of them are just inaccessible. Or we've received information that's kind of um, bizarre that we can't corroborate that the officials oh, okay. on the ground we're getting weird information and then the canadian defense attache in that area is also trying to get information and and it just doesn't make sense and mm. then we've had situations where the people who have allegedly found this wreckage are now demanding money from the families of the fallen and we're just like what is happening right now and we yeah, can't even yeah. We can't even confirm that that crash site is there. A- anyway, so there's a lot of different things to consider, but ultimately it's, um, it is ultimately the uh, who owns the aircraft. And then we okay. kind of make decisions depending on a variety of variables and circumstances as to what we're going to do. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of frequently talking with, especially my British and Australian counterparts, like we're constantly emailing each other of, of this is what's happening. What do yeah. you want to do? What do you, and what do we do or whatever? So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And then Scott put a comment saying it was in remains inside the aircraft, but as you explained, that's not always how it happens. I mean, no. again, just some of these details are obviously macabre because this is dealing with human remains. Yes. But as you said, that these are complicated situations and have to be done properly. Um, but I think hopefully that answers your question, Scott, in that sense, because I've heard of other ones. There was that famous one not too long ago that was recovered in Burma of an RCAF crew. Um, Thinking like 97 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Well, I mean, relatively. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's on the display actually at the Canadian War Museum. They've done a whole uh, part of- Yes, part yes, of I saw that. I saw yeah. that. Yeah, actually, I'll work on that one. <laughs> uh, it was really interesting to work on, but uh, they did a good job because they've got the artifacts from the plane now. And that one, after doing research on it and seeing how it's presented and completely understand what you're talking about, the scale literally of what they were working with. And it can be literally huge. accessibility of it was a story in and of itself because it was found almost by accident. Um, but it was by accident. No one was looking. And it was well done once, you know, the ball got rolling. But it, obviously, like you said, it, it, it took some time to uh, get those things going. So if anyone is in the Ottawa area, I would suggest go 
check out why tell people to go check out the museum regardless but check out that exhibit you know especially because it's on until the fall i think of this year so lots of time to check it out yeah uh, anyway we can keep moving if you want uh yeah if you can go to the slide with the triangle on it yeah this was just more explaining about equality yeah the explaining the process behind it which is, is fascinating with the well initially the imperial war graves commission mm -hmm. and then we talk about that and yeah, just yeah. unknown soldiers to how much they're we can, in there. We can go back to that after. Out there. So yeah, we can go back to that if people ask, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So this is sort of like a timeline when it comes especially to the identification of remains cases. So this is what predominantly I'm going to be talking about for the next little bit. Yep. So um, this kind of gives you a general idea of all the steps we can take in an investigation. We don't always take these all of the steps. Um, right. But usually what happens is that we'll get typically an email from Commonwealth War Graves Commission saying, hey, human remains have been discovered. Here's a discovery of remains report, which gives us, you know, GPS location, um, condition of the remains upon discovery, were there any artifacts found with the remains? And that kind of really gives us our kicking off point. Now, um, there are certain areas of the world uh, where Commonwealth War Graves Commission are less um, uh, sort of less active or, or uh, hmm. yeah, so then we'll get something usually from an embassy or a Canadian defense attache or, you know, something to say, look, we think Canadian human remains have been discovered. So the first thing to do is to go into the history and find out who was in the area, when were they in the area, who died and who went missing. Hmm. Then I have to travel to where their human remains are stored and do my analysis there. So right. like I said, they're not, they're not repatriated to Canada, so I have to go to them. Um, I'll do the full forensic uh, anthropological analysis of the remains to uh, determine the biological profile, and I'll get into that in a later slide. We may also do odontology or forensic odontology, which is uh, forensic dentistry. So um, very, like, there's not many people who are aware of the casualty identification program. There's even less people <laughs> who are aware about the Canadian Forces Forensic Odontology Response Team. So within the Royal Canadian Dental Corps, there's a team of about 12 CAF dentists, Canadian Armed Forces dentists, who are specifically trained in forensic odontology, forensic dentistry, and are ready to be deployed at a moment's notice should Canada receive a request for assistance. And usually it's because of things like a, what we call disaster victim identification or a mass fatality incident. So a plane mm -hmm. crash, uh, a tsunami, you know, earthquake, whatever. And um, they are ready to be deployed and to help with the identification process based on their expertise in ontology. So they're there to help us. Uh, and usually every time I ask them, they're super keen to help us. And they're a great, great, great group of people. The only issue is that I can only really use them in cases from the Second World War and the Korean okay. conflict because there are no dental records in the personnel files of no. the soldiers who died during the First World War. Um, I, I've come across a few, but few. it's very, it's rare. very rare. Um, it's, usually was, like, it's usually like they're missing a tooth like, <laughs> or something. Like yeah, that. exactly. There's not a huge thing. amount of information either. And what I was yeah. told was that there were dental records that were taken but for whatever reason, they just weren't merged with the personnel file after they died. So I don't right. know what happened. They clearly didn't have the foresight that like, hey, 100 years from now, this information could be helpful. Didn't figure that out. So um, I can only really use them for cases from the Second World War. And the right. vast majority of my cases are from the First World War. So I can't even kind of right. use them for that. But uh, I can sort of get into what, how they do what they do because personnel files from the Second World War, I mean, some of them have x-rays in them. I mean, it's, yep, it's incredible. So, so that can be used by them, right? And then mm -hmm. there's a process called stable isotope analysis that for us can right. help us determine place of birth. Place of birth is listed right. on the attestation papers. And um, the reason why this is important, especially for those from the First World War, is about 50 to 60 percent of those who enlisted with the Canadian Expeditionary Force were born in the UK, at some point immigrated to Canada, and then went to fight with Canada. But the stable isotope readings between Canada and the UK are different. Right. So this can help us narrow down the list of potential candidates as much as possible. 
Uh, we do do DNA as well, but DNA is not what uh, the TV shows make it out to be. It's not that simple. It's a bit more it's complicated. <laughs> you know, right? Shocker. Like, I can't just sort of hit a button and then get green flashing on my screen five seconds later saying, oh, my God, we've got a match. Well, we have no. matches, yeah. Yeah, that's not how it works. So one investigation, um, the sheer amount of time that it takes depends on a number of different circumstances. Uh, I had one case that was found in June 2016. December 2016, we had confirmed his identity. So it took six months. Um, on October 4th, we went through what's called a casualty identification review board where we identified three sets of remains. Uh, we're in the process now of reaching out to their families. And um, one of them was discovered in 2010 or 2011. So it took 10 years. So it all depends on a number of different things, right? So um, now I can go through sort of each of those. Uh, so let's just quickly show people how it's done. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. And CSI Vimy, nice, nice, no. <laughs> not <laughs> exactly, not you know. <laughs> No, that's not how that works, unfortunately. Yeah. So what's um, one of the big things, like I said, was our historical research. And uh, the, the military historians at uh, the Directorate of History and Heritage are the ones who do that research. And it all starts from a GPS location of exactly where those remains were found. Mm -hmm. um, and what they've started doing is, is taking uh, something like you see on the left hand side of the screen here is a, a Google Earth image because both the French and the Belgians were really good at rebuilding everything exactly the way it was yeah, before it was destroyed. So yep. roads are in the same place, yep. railways are in the same place. So we can take a Google Earth image and then take the trench maps and then superimpose them on top of the Google Earth image. And then it gives us a general idea of who was in the area, where the sort of the, the objective lines were. Um, and so in this sort of slide here on, on the left hand side, um, the sort of the teal rectangle ish um, is sort of the region where the battalion of interest, like that was their boundaries, right? Right. There is a small purple circle. Yes, not a circle, but square, purple square. That's exactly where those remains were found for this particular case. Oh, okay. um, right. So then you see that the red line is right there. So that kind of gives us an idea of, OK, so what was happening in that area? Did we have a situation where they died during an attack or is this a situation where they were brought back to a clearance uh, station or whatever, and then they died there and they were left there by accident or, you know, so it kind of gives us a general idea of what's happening. So this um, attestation papers uh, from, from the First World War, and um, there's two key pieces of information for me on the attestation papers. There's the date of birth and right. there's their height, right? So right. that's two key pieces of information that I need as a forensic anthropologist. The thing, however, is that many lied about their age. So is the date of birth on this document accurate? And um, many times it's not. Yeah. So um, every time I see an age of like 23 or younger, I'm like, uh, is that yeah. is that accurate or no? Um, so additional research is needed to sort of see if we can find a birth record or a baptism record or anything that could sort of help us determine is this date of birth accurate or not. Right. And many times, like um, right now I'm, I'm dealing with a particular case where I'm talking with the families and the family had to send me a birth record because I mean, it was just off a day. Right. But right. still now, yeah. it, exactly. Right. So, I mean, that's not a necessarily a huge issue when it comes to the anthropology side of things. But right. when we're talking about that soldier, we want to make sure we got the right information. Right. Mm -hmm. well, I've been so, there myself. It happened. Sorry, just to interject real quick. But no, no, no in just random historical work that I do and things that I do, right? I'll I'll be digging or I'm doing research for someone who's asked or what have you. I've noticed that too. Or someone filled in the form wrong or somebody wasn't paying attention. Like that happens all the time. <laughs> or someone has written it wrong and it's scratched out or covered again. So you're not really sure what the date or the month even is. Like it's, it's they were not so paying attention or so formal with a lot of these things. It's very interesting that it's yeah. often wrong. It's very often wrong because of 
they're trying to you know conceal identity uh they're lying about age or someone just made a mistake that happens yeah. frequently well we we identified a a soldier from the royal newfoundland, newfoundland regiment who died during the first world war and when we were looking through their personnel files there was no date of birth there was just age of enlistment and i'm like <laughs> great <laughs> and and the soldier we ended up identifying he enlisted at 16 and died at 17 but on yeah. his attestation paper he was like i don't know 20 age of enlistment and when we saw his photo, there's no way, no way anybody for a second thought that this child was 20 yeah. years old. Like, mm -hmm. no way. So um, even then, and then we were like, well, okay, we got to figure out what his actual date of birth is. And it's like, where do we even start? Because we don't even, we don't know. Anyway, so that's, yeah. So we have to be aware that some of this information may be inaccurate. Now, there's also place of birth on the attestation papers, which could be handy for the stable isotope. We don't necessarily think they lied about that. Now, it might be a situation where, like, uh, here in Ottawa, you know, Gatineau, Quebec is just across the yes. river. So yes. they might say, you know, on their attestation paper, I was born in Ottawa. Yeah. But they actually born in Gatineau, right? Well, for that kind of situation, for the stable isotope, it doesn't really matter because it's literally just almost across the street. Um, yeah. So we don't necessarily think that, you know, they really lied about that in that sense. So... But yeah, it's it's important to kind of question everything, no matter what oh, you find. For, oh, for yeah. any, yeah, that, that just goes for personal records to anyone watching who may be getting interested in historical research. That's just blanket advice. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the same thing comes with the artifacts. So yeah. um, there's quite a few people out there who loot these graves. They rob these graves. Yeah. They strip the human yeah. remains of the artifacts. Um, and, and for anybody listening, don't do that. You're essentially do that. guaranteeing that that, soldier will never be identified by doing that. So don't do that. Mm -hmm. It's it's yeah. wrong on so many different levels. And but even so, if the soldier is found with an identification disc or what we commonly know as dog tags, yeah. uh, which were not really common, uh, especially during the First World War, yeah. if it's found with a metal dog tag, well, we kind of have to ask ourselves, well, did this actually belong to this person? And what's more important also, it's kind of like, well, where was it found when the body was discovered? Because if it's right. found in his hip area, well, did he have it in his pocket? And if he had it in his pocket, why? And if yeah. it's found around his chest area, shoulder title, shoulder area or whatever, then you're like, okay, well, maybe he was wearing it. So we constantly have to ask, even rings with initials on it. Now, uh, if we take Duncanson, for example, when they found his remains, he was actually wearing it on his wedding finger on his left ring finger uh, mm. and a ring with his initials on it. So it's highly likely that it belonged to him because he was actually wearing it when we found his remains. Right. But others, they tend to just be next to the remains or under the remains. And is this a situation where let's say you had two friends who um, were engaged in battle. One of them dies and the friend says, you know what, I'm going to take the ring or the identification disc or whatever right. and send it back to his family that soldier puts it in his pocket and then like an hour later he dies with that in his pocket right so we have to question everything that's found with the human remains do a sort of as much historical background research as we can to try to get an understanding of what happened so that's kind of really step one in the entire process if you go to the next slide um, this is really sort of my main responsibility when it comes to any type of identification any type of investigation is the anthropological analysis of the remains. So the first thing I have to ask myself are, are the bones human? Uh, because many times you will have people who think that they are being helpful, who stumble upon human remains, collect everything, um, which again, don't do that. If, if, you're, <laughs> if you stumble upon human remains, wherever you are, just call the police. Just don't <laughs> touch them, just call oh, the gosh. police. Don't pick everything up thinking you're gonna be helpful to bring them out of the woods, no. Just just call the police. <laughs> and I'm going to jump in there again because I yes. keep seeing that constantly online is also don't touch munitions. Like, just don't touch stuff. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. I don't know why people do that or, like, people kicking it. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, just, just call. leave it alone. Like, and this isn't, this comes up more than you'd think. And it happened in the area where I grew up this past summer. Someone pulled a mortar out of the harbor. Like, don't touch it. Yeah. <laughs> That's just general things. Don't touch it. I mean, it's yeah, just, just... Just call the police. Just, yeah, just whatever you find, call the police. And anyway, so what happens when people don't call the police and think they're being helpful? 
Uh, they're like, okay, well, uh, we have uh, human remains here, you know, in a bucket or whatever. And then I'll get to be the one who starts sorting everything out. And I remember at one point I found something that was like this big and like this thick around. And I'm like, yeah. that guys, this is, this is not human. <laughs> and they were sure that it was human. And I'm like, no, like this, I mean, this is obviously part of a cow or a horse or something to that effect. Like what is anyway. So I have to sort of sort everything out to make sure that the remains I'm looking at are in fact human. Mm -hmm. I also have to determine what's called the minimum number of individuals. Do I have one person right. or do I have more than one? Uh, we had another situation where there was some construction going on on a on the land of a sort of uh, factory of some sort. And uh, the construction worker or worker who works for the factory, uh, they stumbled upon human remains and some artifacts. Again, thought they were being helpful. They picked everything up, put everything in a bucket, called the police three weeks later. By that time, they had paved everything over. Oh, and then they were just like, Okay, here's one person. You, there's no way there's enough in here to be more than one person. Well, guess what? When I sorted everything out, there were three people of in course. there. But because everything had been paved over, nobody could go back to see if they could mm -hmm. find the rest of yeah. those three. So um, it happens quite a bit, unfortunately. And a lot of the times it's, it's, it's because of people who don't know any better. And they think they're being helpful when they're actually creating more problems and essentially guaranteeing that I won't be able to identify some of those remains. So it makes it a little bit complicated, but when I do uh, have access to the remains and I sort everything out, I lay everything out in anatomical order, kind of like the little picture you see here. And I put together what's called the biological profile. So it's things like sex, age, stature, or height, uh, things like ancestry. Now there's a very big con a conversation happening right now in the field of forensic anthropology related to um, racism and yep. trying to determine ace ancestry based on skeletal morphology. So the shape of certain parts of the body um, is inherently racist. And the methods that were created back in the 50s, uh, yes, even the terminology that was used, and there was only three categories that were being used, essentially white, black, and Asian. Um, and that, that doesn't kind of work. Um, so there is a very big conversation. Now, the reason why, um, I keep it in the biological profile and look at ancestry is because there are some, for example, who were born in China, who were born in Japan, um, who enlisted with the Canadians. And, you mm -hmm. know, since we're looking at the late 1800s, when these individuals were born, uh, population mixing, you know, travel wasn't necessarily as easy <laughs> as it is today back then. So it's, it's on the off chance that just one day I might be able to sort of focus on one particular individual based on that. However, um, race is not something that's listed in the personnel files. Uh, for the First World War, you'll have things like hair color, eye color, complexion. Yeah. Now for complexion, I've seen things like, yeah. I've seen dark, I've seen pale, I've seen fresh. What does that mean? I've seen ruddy, so I'm like, yep. there's no, there's no scale, uh, you know, objective scale to tell me exactly what those terminologies mean. But if on that one chance that I'm getting a skull that's sort of telling me, okay, these seem to be features that are more commonly seen in Asian populations, um, and I have some Asian names in my list of candidates, then maybe I can focus on them first. Now it doesn't mean that I'm going to forget about everybody else. But I might focus on them first in the hopes that, you know, we get a result a little bit quicker. But it's still within the understanding that there's a big conversation happening in forensic anthropology right now and uh, surrounding the validity and uh, the usefulness or not of trying to determine ancestry based on bone structure. Um, I also look at trauma. Uh, Anti-mortem trauma is before death. Perimortem is uh, around the time of death. Uh, and postmortem is after death. Now, this really only helps if there's something in the personnel file that said, you know, broken arm five years ago, uh, because that'll still appear on the bone. So, uh, but other than that, like, I don't try to figure out what the cause of death was. Um, it's, I mean, that's already been determined. It's mm. the war. There's no point in me trying to reinvent the wheel <laughs> and try to figure out exactly how each of them, each of them died. 
So um, I also look at pathology or illness on the bone. Again, it's highly unlikely that I'm going to find something uh, because they had to pass a, uh, a health exam, right, yep. to be able to, uh, to enlist. Right. And for illness to yes. affect the bone, <laughs> yeah, well, for illness to affect the bone, yes. it, it has to be pretty severe, usually. So, you know, kind of unlikely. However, um, yes, and you were right that I was in France analyzing remains um, in early December of last year, uh, 2021. And one of the sets of remains that I looked at, um, his elbow, there was at some point he fractured his elbow and the pieces didn't fuse back together. So it's essentially a, what we call a non-union fracture where it's, it was fully healed, but it just had not sort of fused back together. So when I was sort of taking the, the, the bones that had been affected because the joint had clearly been affected, um, and I think mobility had been affected as well at his elbow okay. based on how I was trying to put it back together to see if mobility had been affected. So maybe there is a personnel file somewhere in there with a slight note um, mm. that, you know, there's, I don't know, problems with the elbow or, or whatever, right? Yeah. Maybe it's a clue that we can use to help focus our investigation. So in terms of anthropology and anthropological analysis, you know, that's that's the information that I'm looking for. Um, age and height are the two key pieces of information that can help me narrow down the list of candidates. So, yeah. So if you go to the next slide. So, yes, the Canadian Forces Forensic Ontology Response Team. Um, like I said, we'll send them uh, just the dental records for all the candidates on our list. Um, they will either get photographs that I have taken of the remains in mm. the future. I'm hoping to be a bit more sort of active in how I organize things where I'm hoping to have one of the team come with me because right. they have a portable x-ray machine. Oh, okay. and they have specific cameras to do whatever they need to do. So then I can just um, get them to do the entire dental, uh, what we call post-mortem dental analysis. Right. They can take as many photographs as in many angles as they want. They can take x-rays. And then they're the ones who then compare to the anti-mortem data that's in the personnel files. Um, now, there are certain instances where they're able to immediately confirm an identification, or they'll get to a point where they cannot confirm it, but they're sort of like, we're pretty sure it's this guy, but just go ahead and get DNA just to be on the safe side. Right. So there's kind of a number of, of things or what tends to be the most valuable to me is that they're able to exclude, um, exclude a huge number of my list of potential candidates. Right. Um, so we, we had one case where our starting list was 96, which is relatively small, but oh. our starting list of candidates is 96. Um, we had no unit identifier. So we had to look at 21 different units that were in the area. So 96. Based on the age and the height range, the only thing I could narrow it down was to 45 out of the 96. I sent 45 dental records, uh, and then they had the information on the dental material that was found, and they were able to narrow it down to four, with mm. one of the four being the primary candidate. So that is a huge amount of time saved for me, because what takes a ton of time is finding living viable DNA donors um, by doing genealogy research. So if I can have as small a list as possible, like focus on one guy because the C4 team was able to, um, you know, sort of almost exclude everybody else, then that makes my job a lot easier. And they do really fantastic work. And they're kind of just a really fantastic bunch of people and great to hang out with. So uh, I very much enjoy spending time with them. So if you go to the next slide, I think it's stable isotope, if I remember correctly. Yep. Yes. Okay. So stable isotope analysis. I'll try to make this as accessible as possible. Admittedly, I don't understand all of it either because it's not my field. Of <laughs> okay. But, um, when, uh, when we're young and even when we're in utero, when our tooth enamel is being formed and the chemical composition of that enamel, sort of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, uh, hydrogen, strontium, all those chemical compositions that are in the water in the area where you're growing up okay. and in the food, right? Yeah. Well, all of that affects the chemical composition in your teeth. Now, tooth enamel okay. and its chemical composition doesn't change. Once it's been formed, it doesn't change. Now, tooth enamel can go away because of cavity, 
is, but the level of oxygen, for example, stays the same in your tooth enamel. Right. Bone is almost like skin. It sheds on about a seven to 10 year cycle, right? So it's constantly what we call remodeling itself. So it's constantly doing that process. So because of that, the chemical composition in your bones changes based on where you are in the world at that point in your life, right? right. So because we have place of birth in the personnel files and we don't necessarily have their entire trajectory from birth to death, but we do have place of birth, we'll use tooth enamel to see if we can get what we call an oxygen 18 stable isotope reading. And then you, based on the readings that we get, you then compare it to the map that you see on the screen here. And if you see sort of the UK, uh, which is kind of predominantly yellow in color, um, but then you look at Canada that is more green in color. So the readings will be different. And this right. can help us sort of narrow down the list of candidates again, because let's say we have, I don't know, 50, 50 soldiers, um, 20 of them are born in the UK and the rest were born in Canada and the stable isotope analysis comes back to say they're born in the UK. Well, I can then focus on those 20 mm. and, and sort of exclude those 30 that were born in Canada because the stable isotope reading is not what we're looking for. So that helps. Um, it's not something that we use all the time because um, to the, um, the likelihood, honestly, of getting a complete set of human remains is, is not high. Uh, it doesn't right. happen too often. Um, many times uh, the the skull is really, really badly damaged or is just missing altogether. So sometimes mm -hmm. we'll have teeth, but they might be loose. So does it actually belong to that individual right. or does it belong to somebody else? Right. So we don't always use stable isotope analysis, but it's, it is a tool that can help us if uh, if the circumstances and the variables are right. So it's pretty good. If you go to the next one, uh, DNA, I think is the next one. Yes. Okay. So DNA, uh, DNA is great, but man, it's complicated. <laughs> yes. It's complicated. And, and I have a lot of people that when I give these types of presentations, I'm like, why don't you just do DNA? And I'm like, oh God. So I can extract <laughs> DNA from human remains, but if I have nothing to compare it against, it's not going to give me much information, right? And furthermore, these remains have been buried in soil for the lot, if I'm using the First World War, for more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. So depending on what we call taphonomic factors, and taphonomic factors are everything that affects the bone from the moment that person is deceased until the moment that body is discovered. So okay. <laughs> water, soil composition, acid in the soil, uh, insects in the soil, uh, mm -hmm. fauna, you know, uh, scavengers, uh, if there's any uh, plant roots, right? All of these mm -hmm. things will affect the decomposition of a body and it will also affect the condition of the bones. Now, obviously the bones survive better than tissue, skin, organs, but it's it definitely is affected by the taphonomic factors. So Many times it happens where um, DNA, we try to extract DNA from the bone and there's a problem. So we are actually in the process where a brand new company has been awarded a DNA, the DNA contract to work with us to extract okay. DNA. Okay. So what I'm about to say here relating DNA analysis might actually change in the next couple of months because I'm looking at more robust types of DNA that will hopefully resolve some of the issues that we've been having. So. What we have been using is two types of DNA, mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome short tandem repeat DNA. So if you hit your space bar, mitochondrial DNA um, is passed from mother to child. So if I use myself and my brother, for example, uh, both me and my brother got the mitochondrial DNA from my mother. My children will get that exact same mitochondrial DNA. Okay. However, my brother's son got his mitochondrial DNA from his mother. Right. Right. So when we're looking for mitochondrial DNA donors, we got to find very specific people in the family tree. Usually we go find, does the soldier have any sisters? Did she have any kids or daughters who then passed it on, passed it on, passed it on. Right. So we right. got to find somebody very 
um, very specific. That type of DNA does not change from one generation to the next. So that's why it's good to sort of establish maternal lineages. There's right. thousands of copies of this type of DNA per cell, and there's thousands of cells in the body. So the likelihood of the mitochondrial DNA surviving is very, very high. They've even extracted it from Neanderthal bones that were 40,000 years old. So wow. it survives very high. However, I get a lot of false positives with mitochondrial DNA because especially within the white population worldwide, about 40 to 50% of us share the exact same mitochondrial DNA profile, even though we're not related. Hmm. So that causes a problem, right? But sometimes it's the only type of DNA that we can use. So that's why DNA is not necessarily, you know, the, the golden goose or the golden ticket. Yeah. Each type of evidence has the same amount of weight uh, within our investigations because there are some issues that pop up with DNA. And, and a lot of the times people, when they hear DNA, they think, okay, well, DNA I got from my father, DNA that I got from my mother, which creates brand new, unique DNA that is uniquely me. Right. Yes. Yes. But that type of DNA doesn't survive very well. And okay. furthermore, it's not like these people who died a hundred years ago left behind a toothbrush that right. has not been contaminated by anything else that we can right. use to compare against the remains. Right. So we can't even use that type of individual uh, DNA. So if you hit your space bar again, for the Y chromosome short tandem repeat, it's typically passed from father to son or those who have the Y chromosome, which tend to be men, XY, while women tend to be XX usually. Um, and it's the same thing. It, it passes from one generation to the next unchanged. So for this, we're looking at, did the soldier have any brothers? Did he have any sons? Did he have any sons? And so on and so forth. So you, when you're doing genealogy, you can just follow the family name usually, and it ends up being quite good. The issue, however, is that there's only one copy per cell as opposed to mm. thousands of copies per cell. So many times I'll send the skeletal sample to the lab, ask them to get the YSTR DNA, and it comes back not suitable for comparison. So I can't mm. even use it, right? But the results are much stronger. There's a higher discriminatory power. So if I can use the YSTR, that's really what I want to use. It's just, it's problematic. And sometimes I can't get it out of the remains because of their condition. Now, if you hit the, the space bar again, there's three results typically. So a lot of people's like, oh, it's a DNA match. Well, to be 100% frank, I've never seen match in a DNA report. I've never seen that <laughs> word in a DNA test report before. That makes sense. So, um, you get excluded, which means there's two differences between the profile. It's enough to confidently say they are not from the fa same family. Great. There's inconclusive results where there's one difference between the profiles. It could mean that they're unrelated, but it could also be because of a mutation that happened at some point where they are in fact related, but something mutated in there to give one difference between the DNA profiles. Okay. Inconclusive results. The words that I'm looking for are cannot be excluded, which means that there's no difference between the results, uh, between the profiles. But like I explained earlier, for the white population, 40 to 50% of us share the exact same mitochondrial DNA profile where there's no differences between the profiles. So then you got to look at the statistical probabilities that come along with this, those results. Okay. And like, yeah, so then you start That's looking into the math and, and, and all these things that admittedly is not my strong suit, you know, and there's a reason why I didn't sort of study to be a mathematician. And um, <laughs> so we, we get a lot of false positives and then it's just, it kind of just, it snowballs because I've got a couple sets of remains where I must have at least five family reference samples each that have given me cannot be excluded results, but they're all false positives. So we got to keep going. Oh. So it's, yeah. So DNA is complicated. Um, and it's a lot of people think that it's, it's, it's really, really a good tool, which it is, but it's not as straightforward as what people tend to believe or tend to think because of TV shows like CSI and, and stuff like that. So it, it's a bit complicated. So yeah. Just a little tiny. So if you go to the next slide. Right. So there's also a lot of issues that pop up when it comes for DNA donation um, because it's, it's strictly voluntary. 
Uh, we'll, we'll ask family members who are viable donors where they find they fall within the right place in the family tree if they're willing to give their DNA. It's a painless process. It's like a giant plastic Q-tip that you rub on the inside of your cheek. So it's painless. It's at no cost to the donors. Will we take care of the cost of everything? But um, you have many families who say no. They mm -hmm. don't want to give their DNA because admittedly it's bizarre. You know, the government of Canada is asking for your DNA. I mean, it's weird. We get that. So um, we, we've gotten hung up on quite a few times uh, where we have to call back and like, it's not a scam. So we have to reassure people <laughs> that the casualty identification program exists. This is why we do what we do. And this is why we're asking for your DNA. Right. Uh, we've had certain instances where the last two living donors have uh, refused to give a DNA donation and asked us to never contact them ever again. They think we're a scam. They think we want money out of them. And unfortunately, no amount of discussion or or uh, sending media articles or um, go, sending them to our website or even other family members who are not viable DNA donors trying to convince them that it's not a scam hasn't worked. So we have to respect that and move on. But they're the last living donors. Nobody else can provide a DNA sample for that soldier for mitochondrial DNA, right? So, which is one of the issues and why I was looking at uh, trying to find different types of DNA that we can use that might hopefully avoid these types of issues in the right. future. Right. Um, it also happens where all viable DNA donors are dead. Uh, we've had certain instances where we had to hire a professional genealogist because the researchers that work with me couldn't find anybody. They had to go up to the great grandmother's generation and then see if she had any sisters and then work their way back down to modern times to see if there's anybody living. But you're then getting into records from the early, eight, excuse me, the early 1800s, yeah. right? Yeah. So it gets complicated. It gets in incredibly complicated. And even the professional genealogist said, look, I, I can't find anybody. Uh, the, the, the records aren't there. They're imprecise. They're unreliable. Um, yep. I just I can't find anybody. So that sometimes is a, a is something that we've encountered a few times and it, it sucks when it does, but it's the reality, right? Yep. If you hit uh, next again, there's a couple of other issues where that we've um, come up with that were quite surprising where uh, there's always a consent form that's included in the DNA test kit. Usually what happens is I'll, I'll contact the lab. Here's the name and address of the DNA donor. They've accepted to give their DNA. The lab will send out a DNA test kit with the consent form directly to that individual. They then send everything directly back to the lab. So nothing comes to me. I right. don't see any DNA. I don't get any of that. But for this person, um, they sent the DNA test kit back to the lab without the consent form. So the lab called me and said, look, can you just get in touch with this person and get them to just fill out the consent form? Sure, no problem. So I called this person. And said, look, I can either mail you a consent form or I can email you a PDF and you just have to print it out, fill it out, and then just mail it to the, you know, the address that's on the top of the form. Um, and they're like, let me think about it. I was like, okay. So about two hours <laughs> later, they call me back and say, yeah, we're not interested in doing this. Don't ever contact us again. And I was like, the hard part is over. The DNA <laughs> is at the lab. Um, so I unfortunately had to ask the lab to, uh, destroy that sample. And we had to do, I think almost another year's worth of research before we were able to find another viable DNA donor for that particular soldier. So that was, that was really, that was really tough that day. Um, then, yeah. we, then there was another situation where DNA, this person had accepted to give DNA, uh, DNA test kit was sent out. And then like two months later, I get a call from the lab and say, look, we still haven't received uh, the DNA test kit from this person. Like, okay. So I call the donor and the donor's like, yeah, I threw out the test kit. Like, okay. When? She's like, pretty much as soon as I got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this was two months ago. I, like, do you have any concerns? Is there anything wrong? Like, is there anything that I can address to make you feel more comfortable? Like, you know, just let me know. And she's like, well, I was talking with my son and he really thinks I should do it. So can you send me a second kit? I'll do it this time. Okay, no problem. So I send a second kit. Again, two months later, I get a phone call from the lab. Uh, we still haven't received the DNA test kit from this person. Okay. So I call this person. Um, I, I get them on the phone and immediately she's like, don't ever call me again. I threw out the second test kit. Nobody in my family wants to do any of this. Don't call us ever again. And I was like, Okay, look, like it's not a problem. It's it's not a problem if you don't want to participate. Just just tell me. 
yeah. because I've now wasted like six months of time waiting for you because you said you were going to do something and then you didn't. And I've waited six months when I could have used that six months to find somebody else in your family tree who would be willing to give a DNA sample. Right. So these are just kind of some of the issues that pop up, which frustrating, yes. Um, but at the same time, you kind of have to understand, like, it's weird. The government of Canada it is, is a little weird. Yeah. It's, it's weird. We get it. But when, thankfully, these types of situations don't happen very often. But Not when they do, it's thing. like, oh, just, mm, okay. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Moving on. So, yeah. 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 So if you go to the next one, I think that might be the last one or the second to last yep, one. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that's kind of like a general overview of the casualty identification program, especially when it's related to the identification of remains. Right. Um, and yeah, so if there's any more questions, happy to answer those. Yeah, there's a few just from before. I, I wanted to wait because they didn't really fit in with what we were talking about we had one about cooperation i can i can just ask it i think i remember it well enough about cooperation uh with the united states uh and the organization i'm not sure what it's called exactly what goes after the, the missing and, and the pow's and all of that um in any any um well maybe even in uh, not so much the first world war but maybe normandy but also maybe in korea is there any sort of working together in any way shape or form um, there, there is, um, there's not as much as I'd like to at the moment. So I'm, okay. I'm trying to, at some point, hopefully establish a sort of more solid relationship. And, uh, their organization is called, or their acronym is DPAA. It's Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. Right. And, um, yeah, so there's been certain instances in the past where they've contacted us where they're, cause they're, they're, they recover, they search, uh, all yep. over the world. Yep. for um, sets of human remains, right? So there have been instances in the past where I'll get an email from somebody at DPAA who's like, oh, by the way, we're digging up these graves. One of them is going to be Canadian, but don't worry about it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not how that works. Um, so then I just kind of, it seems quite a few, uh, quite a few times, cause I, I tend to be dealing with historians a lot who are doing the preliminary hi uh, history research. Um, yeah. and then they get redirected to me through like the, the Canadian defense attache network. And, um, so every time I kind of have to like, you know, politely put my foot down. I'm like, no, <laughs> if you're, if you're thinking there's a Canadian in there, like, this is how the, this works for Canada. So like slow down. And this is what needs to happen if you stumble upon a Canadian. There's because it wouldn't right. surprise me if they would just exhume everything and bring everything back to Hawaii, or I think they have another lab in Nebraska, um, and do everything and and do the identification and and know like each country is responsible for identifying their own. Right. So there's a few times where I've had to sort of like just put my foot down a little bit with with the Americans yeah. um, because they tend to yeah. be very sort of gung ho and and. We're we're gonna go ahead and do it, which is not a bad right. thing. No, but no, you know, other countries don't do it the same way. Now, um, I saw the question if there's anything related to DPAA related, uh, linked to Korea. Uh, specifically, yeah. no, because we okay. have a memorandum of understanding with the Republic of Korea and their uh, organization who does uh, recovery and identification of human remains in Korea. Uh, okay. the, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's um, MACRI. I think it's uh, Ministry of Defense Agency for Killed in Action Recovery and Identification or, or something like that. And um, right. <laughs> yeah, we, set, we signed an MOU with them this past June uh, because they their organization, and yes, they collaborate very much with the Americans, uh, but they're now starting to uh, go through the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. Oh, they are. Uh, okay. Yes, they're, they've started doing that, and they're finding, quite a bit, yeah. yeah, they're finding quite a bit of human remains. So um, I'm in the process right now of, of reaching out to the families of the 16 in the hope that they're willing to donate DNA so that it can be kept at the lab in Korea, and then they can just continuously test against whatever's right. discovered um and and stuff like that and the thing with korea is that some of them have siblings um that are still living which is ideal in terms of yep. relationship for dna donation so uh that's something that i'm currently working on yeah that, that's great i mean i was going to ask because i know that was a difficulty uh previously was and 
is because of the demilitarized zone that separates the two Koreas right now. And right. there's always tendons <laughs> and everything, and it makes it difficult. But uh, that's good to know that that is taking place because I know that's, and then that's also for our American viewers as well. That's that's good to know because high number of American casualties and dead in that war as well. So that that's yeah. good to know generally. Uh, so following that question, there was a question about Hong Kong, another one I'm not too sure about. I know there was work after the battle, sorry, after the war had ended. Um, there's a good, been some good, you know, scholarship on that, but I don't know about currently or recently if anything has come up. There's not that many missing from Hong Kong. I don't know honest, the number off the top I of my head. I have no idea. Yeah, um, it's not something. Um, yeah. It's not something that we're tracking. Um, okay. um, but if I remember correctly, again, this was before my time. I think we do have one case file of something related to Hong Kong, but this okay. might have been before I started in this position. Um, but again, it'd be a situation of if something is discovered, right? right. And then there's something on the remains that kind of think Canadian more than something else, then yep. yes, um, we would kick into gear and see what we could do. But it's it's not something that's been on my radar in the last five and a half years since I've been in this position. Yeah, it's just, it's unlikely due to number alone. I mean, there's not that many missing to begin with from Korea. I don't even know what it is. It's not very many. Um, in Korea, it's only 16. Yeah. That's and, and that was... Well, <laughs> Korea, I don't know what, 10 times the amount of Canadians in Hong Kong. So it's uh, it's just a math thing, I think, by the end of it. And again, too, at the nature of, we've kind of talked about that, the nature of, uh, well, we got a lot of more questions here. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> I was just trying to find the old ones. They just kind of popped up there. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, I think it has to do with the nature of the combat and theater and all those conditions you were talking about before play a huge role in a lot of this. That I know. Um, but we had someone asking Shell Rig asking about, um, I don't know if I know the details of this story at all, of uh, the, the Riley soldier uh, for the Hamilton Light Infantry. Uh, sure. It was sent to Breffield. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's Sergeant Collis, Sergeant John Albert Collis. Uh, essentially, partial remains were found in early January 2017. Again, a situation where the father son metal detector team kept the discovery to themselves, called the authorities no. three weeks after the fact. Uh, there were no uh, national identifiers, only Commonwealth equipment was found with the remains, um, but okay. Canada was given a chance to try to identify first because the Canadians were more so active in the area, more so than the British. Yep. Um, and in the end, this was actually the case where uh, the Canadian Forces Forensic Ontology Response Team took my list of 96 uh, potential candidates, which I had narrowed down to 45. And then they narrowed it down to four with Sergeant Collis being their primary candidate. We did DNA with his paternal nephew. Um, and what had happened uh, was that these were partial remains that were left behind after the war because Sergeant Collis was already buried in Bredville de Solaz Canadian War Cemetery. Uh, he already had a grave. Right. So yep. under normal circumstances, we would not have included him in our list of potential candidates. But the reason why we did is because okay. a ring with the initials JAC had been found with the remains, but it didn't correspond to any, any of the missing who died in that area. So then we started like, okay, well, and then we started looking and then we found that there was one JAC who died in that area, John Albert Collis, but he was already buried. Right. So, um, and admittedly for, for this, the partial remains, what was discovered was the right forearm, the two hands and uh, the skull, which was quite badly damaged. So it's not uh, so far fetched to believe that uh, when he died, those pieces kind of might've been transported elsewhere due to the, I don't know, whatever it was that killed him. Uh, right, 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 right. The severity of the explosion or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when they found his body, there's clearly enough still left on that body to identify him as Sergeant, Sergeant John Albert Collis. Um, but it wasn't his complete remains at the time. So um, right. then it's, it's, it was a matter of just, uh, yes, we don't exhume so that his grave was open. We yep. did not check what was inside. We added the new casket that we had specially made, the smaller casket with the remains of uh, the extra remains. We placed that on top of the casket that was in the grave, and then we closed the grave uh, at the at the interment ceremony that we had in June 2019. 
Yeah, I think I saw the photos. Sorry, I missed. I my eyes are playing tricks with me. I think I've had a longer day than I thought. It said reunited. It literally said reunited. I just misread yeah. it um, about being literally reunited, which is yeah. you just don't often hear that. <laughs> that that is very rare. No, this this was kind of this was a first for us where yeah. he already had a grave, and we were like, okay, well, this is new. How do we deal with Normandy, this? Particularly with Normandy, especially, it's uh, it's it's mm -hmm. very uncommon. Um, for minors, this one's it's more current. You might not be able to talk about it, but is DNA collected from current members for use in identification? I have no idea. I think the answer is no, but I don't okay. know. Okay, it's, that's not within my realm of responsibilities. That would be yeah. a question that's better directed to what's called the Directorate of Casualty Support Management, which they're the ones when there's a modern casualty, a modern death. Uh, they are the ones who who do this entire process uh, for that. So I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I didn't think you would, but it's uh, it's interesting to ask because of how it can have possibly, hopefully not, that there's more conflict coming. You know what I mean? But having future historical um, application, I think, is is really interesting. Now, again, this is probably not something you deal with, but uh, this is from Roger, who's also another great supporter of the work I do, asking about the graves at sea. I know that's probably not something you've dealt with, or maybe if you could speak about anything you've heard towards this, because I, I have heard this is becoming an increasingly problem, especially more and more every day. Right. Um, okay. So this is something that uh, keeps coming up kind of almost on a yearly basis um, and is to, you know, protect uh, those war graves and create a legislation to protect those war graves. Um, because yes, looting, like I said, looting happens, right? And if somebody knows where that site is, right? Um, and there's no legislation in place, but I know that there's there were discussions at one point that, and because it falls more within the realm of like Transport Canada and other oh, government God. departments, um, right. it's it's predominantly with them. Uh, now they come to me and and ask me, you know, questions about, you know, what kind of remains are in there, or or what what could we expect okay. if we were discovered or something like that. But um, I do know that it, it's making the rounds. I just don't know where that piece of legislation is at this point. Okay. Um, but it is definitely something that has been discussed between Parks Canada, Transport Canada, National Defense, okay. uh, but sort of parks and transport being the leads on this as opposed to national defense, because if it's in within Canadian waters, well, that's, that's like a transport Canada thing as opposed to a national defense thing. Right. So, okay. it's, <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, 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 it's quite, um, it's quite complicated and involves a, quite a few government departments, uh, not just of, national. Defense. That's a lot of cooks in the kitchen for something. Yeah. Like that. And I think exactly. that adds to the complication of it. I mean, yes. <laughs> I just heard this is becoming an increasing issue, right? Is is that people are finding these sites? It's not even their whatever trophy hunting or what it is. It's desecration of bodies, basically. But they're stripping the ships of whatever they yep. can get that has value. So I know I'm yep. hearing about this more and more and more. So it's just it's something we probably doesn't talked about much, but may be becoming an increasing problem, which is unfortunate, but uh, there's nothing much you can do unless there's legislation put in place and people try to actually stop it. But mm -hmm. again, I don't know. I've just heard about that legislation myself, but I, I haven't heard if it's going forward or anything of that nature. Uh, and this just going back to the DA question, I guess we have a former serving member answering no. So there's the answer. <laughs> Solves that problem for us. Uh, yeah. So anybody else has any questions? We're on a bit of a delay. So we'll just give them a little bit if more people questions, but I don't think I've missed anything. Um, yeah, I mean, is there any, you might not have an answer, but this is something I've been thinking about any future potential issues or more that's coming up because I know a lot of areas, particularly in France are being developed and this is happening more frequently. It's not necessarily happening for Canadians, but it is happening. Is there yeah. more resistance in France because of the development that's being done? Like, is there anything like that happening? Or um, well, okay, so there's there's um, a current project that um, us, I believe, I know for a fact the Brits, I know for a fact Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and I believe the Germans are also kind of keeping an eye on. And um, <clears throat> it's, yeah, so in France, they are planning to dig a canal, a large shipping canal to right. take yeah. tractor trailers off the roads and be able to ship by water, you know, all of these things. 
Um, and it's going right through battlefields. <laughs> of course it is, right? Well, I would have to. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're kind of every nation. I mean, it's predominantly right now Commonwealth War Grace Commission because they are on the ground in northern France. They have a facility near Arras. So um, right now they're kind of sort of coordinating everything and, and, and sort of making sure that in terms of archaeology, the archaeology is being done to ensure okay. that we were able to collect as many and recover as many sets of remains as we possibly can. Because also we've seen photographs of the equipment that's going to be used to dig this canal. And it is huge. Oh, I bet. It's massive. And there's no, if that goes through that field, it's just going to destroy everything in its path. And there's no way that anybody's going to be able to tell it to stop because you're about to hit something because it's just going to be too late because these things are massive, massive yeah. pieces of machinery. So, um, so we're all kind of just on waiting to see, you know, <laughs> what happens with this. Um, there's a lot of uh, development that's happening around the area of the Battle of Hill 70, which yes. a ton of our sets of remains that we're trying to identify. Uh, the program's working on uh, 42 skeletons right now that we're trying to identify. Wow. Um, and the vast majority of them come from the area of the Battle of Hill 70. Which and um, some the, um, what's it called? Some of the development that's happening or has been happening in the last couple of years are there. And um, I know, I think there's like 150 bodies that were found from that one construction site. Yeah, not, surprising. not all Canadians, nope. but uh, definitely something that is going to affect us. And so much so that um, it, it's now to a point that the, the nearest cemetery is is full. So <laughs> then what, right? So that's another consideration that pops right. up is that in these cemeteries, yes, we say we want to bury them in the closest appropriate cemetery, but what happens if that cemetery is full? Right. And then with this canal project, you know, we don't know exactly how many sets of remains are going to be found. We, we, there's an estimate uh, but where are they going to go, right? So, um, yeah. So it's it's constant, um, and it, it can be a simple thing as you know, just um, plowing your your the farm fields. Uh, Archaeology before uh, a, a construction site gets yep. underway. Um, munitions clearing processes. Uh, because the sheer amount of unexploded ordnance in the ground in France and in Belgium is incredible. Oh, yeah, that's insane. So, many, many, many times the human remains are discovered as part of that munitions clearing process. Yep. Um, so there's, yeah, there, there's a number of different things that we're kind of just sort of monitoring and and ready for if if we need to, to do something about it. Well, this is a, an interesting story because I, I do remember hearing about this, um, about a, a highway basically going through and having to find hundreds. Yep. Yeah, like that's kind of if they do this canal, which I, I forgot about. I had heard about it, but I'd forgotten. It's going to be massive. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine um, what would happen. And I, at this one, I did not know about an, an airport near near Arras about moving so many. I mean, that would just be that's yeah, five thousand yeah. graves. I mean, logistically, that's just a, a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, I, I I wouldn't want to touch that. No, no, me <laughs> neither. Well, it, and one thing I did want to ask him because I know it's not. Um, it's not a Canadian. It wasn't Canadian. It was a Anzac battle. Maybe it was Australian, but it was Pheasant Wood. It's the newest. It oh, from L. Yeah, from L. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that going to be, maybe, well, this does lead to what you just brought up about cemeteries being full. Is that what will be done? And a new cemetery would be built, would be made? I mean, as, as far as I'm aware, that's that's one of the options. Um, uh, I know that Commonwealth War Race Commission uh, is, is kind of looking at a variety of different options of what to do. But yeah, so that's what happened with, with Pheasant Wood or the Fromel project, as they call it, yeah. where they found 10 mass graves. Um, they ended up finding 250 bodies in eight of those mass graves. Two of them were empty, but they had been dug. Um, yep. And yes, they, they built a whole new cemetery, uh, which was the first one in what, over 50 years, 70 oh years or something like that, because it, yep. it was built uh, after 2010 or somewhere around there. It's the only one built in the 21st century, I know that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because there was the only way to, to, to deal with these 250 bodies that had been exhumed during an archeological excavation um, and the identification process, uh, from what I understand, is still ongoing. Yeah, uh, so in this case, well, yeah. they, they buried everybody as an unknown, but they had collected as much physical evidence as they could, including DNA, before burial. Yep. And, and the identification process was going to come later so that they could then just change uh, the headstone with one with their name on it. So.
Yeah, and, and I've been there, and it's 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 an interesting, obviously, because it's the newest one, like I said. So you have 21st century influences on it, right? Because people, from what I've heard, again, it's just reading about it coming after it and, and all of that. But people were very willing to help, and with the DNA especially, that people were willing to do that. And a lot of those graves have, this is outside your work, but have inscript like epitaphs on them, which is fairly rare, right? Because families just could not afford to do so back at the time, but now they just let them do that. And there, it's just, it's, a, it's an interesting case study for things that you do, commemoration and and everything. I just couldn't get away without asking about how that is going because I figured it would be ongoing and it's going to yeah. take a long time after hearing about your presentations and literally how long these things take because that wasn't that long ago, especially in terms of all of this. But uh, yeah, lots of great comments, everyone loving the presentation. So uh, so thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it again. Uh, people want you to come back. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe we can uh, get something if you got something, something new on the go. We'll see what we can do. Um, but yeah, so thanks again. I really appreciate That's it. That's my pleasure. Yeah, it was, it was great to hear. I mean, I've heard you talk about this stuff, I think, twice now, but it's still fast now. I'm always learning something and I'm always just, it's one of those mind boggling things when you get into the numbers or the process or the stories, because there's always new stories, new people involved, all that stuff. It's it's always great to hear. So uh, yeah, so I'm just going to say goodbye and I'll, I'll come say goodbye for you before we uh, sign off completely. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, this one was a great one. Lots of great information. Uh, you're probably gonna need to watch it again just to get some of those details down because I think I'm gonna have to when I refer to some of this stuff. It's it's great, but Dr. Lockyer knows so much and it's we're, we're so lucky to have her come on the channel and explain what she does. So very appreciative of this. Thanks again. Uh, if, you like the, if you like everything, just like the video, please comment below. It helps more people see it uh, and subscribing as well is always extremely helpful. If you like the work and everything I'm doing, please check out the Patreon link. You can help me out by a couple of bucks a month and you get lots of benefits. And I've got some new stuff up coming for that. So keep an eye on that as well. If you already are a patron, there's things coming. Uh, and then also on Wednesday, uh, I believe if Roger is still watching, he will be on the channel talking about the first women in the uh, Royal Canadian Navy, which is a fascinating story that he's done a ton of work on. So I'm really looking forward to that one. So we'll have him on and that'll be at 7 p.m. as well uh, for the next one on Wednesday. So thanks. Uh, Thanks in advance for those of you who are going to come out and watch that one. That's going to be a really interesting story to hear. So thanks for coming on. Did you enjoy coming on? Wasn't too pressure for you? Wasn't too difficult? Oh, no, no, no. This, this, no. This was, uh, as this was a pleasure, and it's just like chatting. And and admittedly, um, these these kinds of things are fun for me. Um, you know, my public mm -hmm. affairs person is like, you're going to regret telling me that you like doing media interviews because <laughs> Um, and so, no, so this was really great. And it, it allowed us to, uh, to go delve deeper a little bit in, in sort of how the program works because, mm. um, yeah, when I do present it at the, the military history conference, like I get 20 minutes and I'm like, yeah. there's, there's no way I can go through everything no. in 20 minutes. And I want to give a sort of, you know, uh, a case study where there's, there's a, a, from start to finish where you, you can get a good sense of, of, of what the work is, but also get the emotional impact of, of the story with the soldier and hopefully his face if we have a photograph. Yep. Um, so, but this was good to be able to just talk about the program and how we operate what we do. And, and I'm more than happy to come back on if, if you think there's something else we can talk about. And well, uh, I'll yeah, something out. I always do. I'm pretty good at uh, by this point and making ways things connect and have people come back and talk about stuff. Because I do, like you just said, I just enjoy talking about it, learning new stuff and connecting in Canadian military history in any way I can. So, so thanks again. Uh, and we'll sign off now. So thanks everyone for coming out and uh, thanks for all your great questions, everybody. It was great to have everybody on.